Jersey TV. If you don't mind, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin this show by giving a shout out to a dear sister, Rhonda Cardwell. Rhonda, I hope you don't mind me mentioning your name on the air here. I just received a lovely email from her telling me how much she appreciated yesterday's show. I thought it was a clear presentation of the two evangels and that really heartens me. Uh, Rhonda is the widow of a dear brother of mine, Nelson Cardwell, who died, boy, what has it been now, 10 years ago? I got to speak with him when he was on his deathbed. Rhonda and Nelson lived in Texas and just such a dear brother, a supporter of the work, a friend. Visited them at their home in Amarillo. Dan Sheridan and I did some shows there in Amarillo. And so good memories of that time. And thank you, Rhonda, for your email. And I dedicate this show to Nelson and to those who have died in Christ, our brothers and sisters who have died in Christ. Nelson Cardwell, Nelson Howe, my friend Charlie Cronk, who you hear on the Grace Cafe broadcasts, he died of liver cancer. Oh my gosh, maybe it's been 12, 13 years ago now. Gene Douglas, a fellow laborer who filmed a lot of the early conferences, traveled with him on some evangel tours just a really fun guy and an earnest earnest student very selfless he was always there to support everyone else but when he spoke he had a lot to say he was very knowledgeable about the scriptures and then my dear friend Cheryl Crow no not the singer the famous Cheryl Crow the one in the body of Christ you may remember, probably, who knows, 10 years. I don't know how long ago I did a... I went to her house. She was a cancer victim who had no feet, one hand. And she was afraid all the time that the cancer was going to return. And she died this year. I was able to speak to her on her deathbed. You know, uh, nobody else die, okay? This, this, don't, don't. Let's all survive to the coming of Christ, shall we? That's my hope and prayer today. And I honor those who have died in Christ. Not only these precious saints that I've mentioned here today, but others down through the years. And James Coram died, must be three years ago now, the business manager of the Gordon Publishing Concern. I hosted him at my home several times. He spoke at my conference in Willard, Ohio. He hosted me in Santa Clarita, California at uh, Concordant Publishing Concern headquarters. And when I was traveling with Dan Sheridan, he hosted us there. An amazing intellect, great spiritual giant, James Quorum, And all these folks and more unfortunately more than I can mention um, died in Christ but not without an expectation because the dead in Christ will rise first so um, tonight 6 30 p.m. the live stream with Catherine Holmes Catherine just uh, sent me a voice text saying that her confidence is in God. And I said amen to that. I have no confidence in my flesh. Every time I sit here, I just utter a prayer to God out loud, really. It's not by rote. It's just from the heart. It's like, God, please help me. Because I, I come here in front of this microphone in complete weakness, complete and total helplessness apart from God's enabling. 
It's been that way. It, it's a pattern. Since the first time I ever spoke at a conference, I was a wreck. My knees were shaking. I it felt like Gethsemane to me. And I went into the bathroom of that hall in Wyndham, Ohio, spring of 94. And I knelt in front of the soap caked sink and I just prayed to God. I said, God, please help me. Please help me. And I'll never forget the words God gave me. He said, they're not here to hear you. They're here to say what God ought to have to say through you. Man, I've never forgotten that. Never forgotten it. Anytime I speak on the scriptures, I bring that to mind. And it's never changed. It's the same state of weakness every single time. Like, God, please help me. So to hear from Rhonda and from you that yesterday's show was such a blessing to you, that it was a clear presentation that even a child could understand, that really heartened me. So thank you for your comments i i believe like a child myself and i have to understand these things with a childlike understanding before i can explain them and help others understand them and yes it's a gift of god and i'm thankful for it so i will see you tonight tune in i won't have this green screen here though you'll have to look at my regular background uh, this is what it's going to look like just just to prepare you for tonight you're right see hey little tv back there a plant i got a fan over here but, um, yeah but it'll be it'll be great i'm looking forward to it a lot so i hope to hear from you i hope you pop in and say hello somebody made a great comment on yesterday's show speaking of yesterday's show and uh, it was not a question as much as, ooh, I'm not sure I understood what you were saying, Zender. This is, a, this is great. This is from 1967 True Blue. I, I, I don't know who this is. Maybe I do, but <laughs> speaking to you now, I don't know who it is. He or she said this, The idea that the circumcision evangel is not based upon the cross seems to contradict what Paul taught in Hebrews chapter 7 through chapter 10. This is a very astute comment because Hebrews, we believe, I am confident Hebrews was written by Paul to his brothers according to flesh who had seen the kingdom withdraw to an undetermined time in the future. And what is Paul teaching about in Hebrews? If not, the cross of Christ. But he's not speaking of the cross of Christ you know how many times in he Hebrews chapter 7 through 10 the word cross is used? Zero. In the entire book of Hebrews, the word cross appears one time. And this is from the man who said in one of his own letters, I came among you knowing nothing except Christ Jesus and him crucified the cross was everything to this man and yet here he is writing this weighty letter to the hebrews and only one mention of the cross and it's not even related to what christ accomplished at the cross and i'm going to show you evidence of that yet when we go to hebrews chapters 7 through 10 what words do we find? In Hebrews chapter 7, the word priest occurs 11 times. Could be a couple more. I just went through quickly and circled, the time, but you get the point. There's a lot of references to priest. And for Israel, Christ is a priest. For us, he is not a priest. A priest is a go-between. We're part of his body. It's so much more intimate. We're not even part of the bride. Israel is the bride of the lambkin. I used to think, well, bride, that's the closest you can be to the groom. No, it's not. How about this? Being the groom. Being a part of his body. We are not the bride of Christ. Israel is called the bride of the lambkin. And he is not our high priest. Israel is looking for him to return as high priest 
because he's going to be the high priest, the chief priest, according to the new order of priesthood, the order of Melchizedek. He's going to be a priest in the thousand-year kingdom. So as I said yesterday, even in the 1,000-year kingdom, Israel is not coming into the truths of justification. Here's a little teaser for tomorrow. I'm going to talk about why we have this truth now. Why is it that even though all humanity was considered to have died with Christ, and God actually sees the whole human race as a new humanity, why don't other people come into it? But specifically, why doesn't Israel finally... When they're saved in Eon 4 and the kingdom has come, why aren't they teaching justification? And there's a reason for that, and I'm going to give you one verse from Paul that is just going to wow you when you see the degree of favor that God has shown to us in the middle of a dark world. In Hebrews 9, the word blood, this is critical, the word blood appears eight times. Could be nine, could be seven. I like the number eight. It's a lot. Hebrews 9, the blood. In Hebrews 10, priest is noted twice and blood twice. Nothing about the cross except one reference and I am saving that reference for the end because this is a revelation that I have not seen until today. That's right. There's something I just saw today in light of this comment by 1967 True Blue. I'll read that comment again. The idea that the circumcision evangel is not based upon the cross seems to contradict what Paul taught in Hebrews 7 through 10. But again, as I just showed you, you can read Hebrews 7 through 10 yourself. There is not one mention of the word cross, but there's blood and there's priesthood. I'm going to end this show by giving you the significance of blood and how it is different than the cross. Well, isn't the blood and the cross, it's all the same? No, it is not. It's not the same at all. But I, again, I'm not criticizing True Blue here. I really appreciate this comment because... It's opened up a vein of truth, and it's caused me to see something that I've never seen before. Paul is the herald of the cross of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the word of the cross. I want to point something out to you, that the definite article, every time Paul mentions the word cross in his letters, the definite article is before cross, the the in the Greek, the. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the word of the cross. Galatians 5, 11, the snare of the cross, of the cross of Christ. Galatians 6, 12, persecuted for the cross of Christ Jesus. Galatians 6, 14, boasting in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 18, Enemies of the cross of Christ. Ephesians 2, 16. Reconciling the both, that is, Jews and Greeks, into one body through the cross. The definite article is definitely in the Greek text because in the concordant version, it's in dark face type. If the article is not in the original Greek text, but it needs to be supplied because of for the sake of making a readable sentence, then you will see the the in light face type indicating that the Greek word the is not to be found in the original text. Philippians 2, 8, obedient unto death, speaking of Christ, even the death of the cross. Colossians 2, 14, nailing the decrees to the cross. 1 Corinthians 1, 17, lest the cross of Christ be made void. Keep that in mind. Bookmark that. How many times do you think Peter mentions the cross? Zero. First and second Peter, no mention of the cross. But he mentions blood twice. Before this show is over, you're going to realize the significance of this. So all these passages I've just read you out of Paul 
heralding the cross of Christ, the cross of Christ, the cross, the cross. Here is the only mention of the word cross in the entire book of Hebrews, written by the same man who does nothing in his letters except herald the cross. Speaking of the snare of the cross, the word of the cross, persecuted for the cross, boasting in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, lest the cross of Christ be made void. Here's the one reference to cross in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. I'll start to get the context. It's in verse 2. I'm going to start in verse 1. Surely in consequence then, we also have so vast a cloud of witnesses encompassing us, putting off every impediment and the popular sin, may be racing with endurance the contest lying before us, looking off to the inaugurator and perfecter of faith, Jesus. No, he says, notice he says Jesus, not Christ Jesus, the exalted Son of God, but Jesus, the one who was the Lamb of God and who came to take away the sins of Israel in accord with the Old Testament types. That's a big clue. It's coming up. Hang on. Jesus, who for the joy lying before him endures a cross, despising the shame, besides is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What? Who for the joy lying before him endures a cross? A cross? What about the cross? Isn't the cross the centerpiece here? No, it is not. It is not the centerpiece of the circumcision gospel, of the Israel gospel, of the gospel that Paul was writing to his fellow countrymen concerning. Because as I told you yesterday, the cross does away with national distinctions. The cross is the end of Israel advantage. We can't have that in the thousand-year kingdom. The cross is the inauguration of the new humanity. And the new humanity allows us the luxurious truth of justification by faith. Israel, even during the thousand years, is not justified by faith. They're just doing the law perfectly. No one in the flesh at this point can be justified by works of law. We know that. And that's why God erased the old humanity. But I quoted from Isaiah yesterday that the law will still go forth from Zion. And we know, as I said yesterday, there's a temple in, in Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom. And this all speaks of the law. Israel will be doing the law perfectly. That's why they're perfect because they're doing the law. They're finally able to do everything of the law perfectly just as our Lord did when he was on earth. And justification can only thrive in the absence of law. We are reckoning a man to be justified by faith apart from from works of law. Whenever you're talking about justification, you're talking about apart from works of law, apart from works of law, except in the thousand-year kingdom. And the only reason it's an exception there is because Israel is doing the law perfectly, because God writes the law on their hearts. So what is Paul saying here in verse 2 of Hebrews 12? He endures a cross. He's just speaking of the extent to which Jesus went what he was willing to endure, a Roman crucifixion, a Roman means of death. This is not, this is not a exposition upon the meaning of the cross of Christ. And you notice I said yesterday, the, the cross of Christ is not part of the Israel evangel. The death of Christ, now oh, that's another matter. And the blood of Christ that's what ties him to the ultimate sacrificial lamb portrayed by the types in the Old Covenant. He endures a cross. So I, this is what I never saw before. And even A is in light-faced type. He endures cross. 
Paul's almost going out of his way not to emphasize the manner of Christ's death because it is the manner of Christ's death that Israel could not grasp. To Israel, Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the types. And the type was seen over and over again, year after year after year. This is what Hebrews is talking about. This is why the mention of priesthood is talked about. The old priests of the Levitical order kept dying, kept dying, having to be replaced. Yet there's one chief priest who enters one time into the holy place with his blood, cleanses the altar, cleanses the sins of the people of Israel. It's the ultimate propitiatory shelter. We don't have a propitiatory shelter. We don't need shelter. Sheltered from what? Righteousness? We don't need sheltered from righteousness. The, cru the, the crucifixion of Christ was something that Israel had to repent of. Not only was the cross not the centerpiece of the evangel, when Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after our Lord's resurrection, he implored Israel to repent of crucifying the Lord of glory. The cross was not the centerpiece of the evangel. It was bad news that required repentance. You crucified the Lord of glory. The cross was bad news to Israel. It's good news for us, bad news for Israel. They had no idea what the cross meant. They had no idea because... I've, I know I've said this before, but this is a great context, the context of justification by faith to talk about this again, is that Christ being the fulfillment of the Old Testament types for the sins of Israel. I mean, isn't that what God wanted them to see? The blood of the lamb, throat was slit, the blood was let out. As soon as the blood was let out, the soul is in the blood, so the feeling is in the blood. Without blood, there's no pain. When the blood rushes from your head, you pass out. There's no blood. There's no pain. Blood speaks of suffering. And the lambs, the goats, did not suffer. They slit their throats. The blood was let. And then the sacrifice was offered. There was no suffering. And Christ was the Lamb of God. And when he went to the Roman stake, the sons and daughters of Israel, even his own disciples had to have gone what the hell was that even if they could be convinced that he was the ultimate sacrifice for Israel why wasn't he laying upon an altar had his throat slit died painlessly and wouldn't that have been impressive enough to take a human being the son of God into the altar of the temple offer him much as Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac Abraham wasn't going to torture Isaac Abraham wasn't going to nail Isaac to a cross to a tree no he was going to slit his throat and let out the blood in harmony with the Old Testament types the cross of Christ had nothing to do with the Old Testament types. Because there is nothing in the Old Testament types that even suggests it. I take that back. I take that back. When Moses put the serpent on the pole... That was just a dim, dim suggestion, but it's more of a suggestion than the lambs on the altar. Put the serpent on the pole and anyone who looked at it was cured. Jesus Christ became sin on that pole. It wasn't a cross, it was a pole, it was a stake. Concordant should make it stake. The Greek word is stander. Staros is the Greek word, the English element is stander. It was a stake. But the torture of Christ was the thing that not even the Lord's disciples could wrap their heads around. Because what was happening there on the cross was more than simply the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, offering up his blood once and for all, as 
Paul explains in Hebrews for the sins of Israel. Again, if it was only that, then we would have seen a far different death. He did shed his blood. This is why blood is mentioned in Hebrews. Peter mentions blood. Peter never mentions the cross. He mentions blood because that, again, ties back to the Old Testament types and the lambs. He was the ultimate lamb of God who shed his blood, shed his blood. That's as far as Israel could go. I want you to really see this. This is as far as they could go. The blood of the lamb shed for our sins. The blood of the lamb, blood of the lamb. What, what, what about the whip? And the crown of thorns, the humiliation, the, the nails through the wrists and the feet. What was that all about? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't want to talk about that. That's what they said. I don't know. But they didn't even talk about that. The blood of the lamb slain for us. The blood of the lamb. Blood of the lamb. The blood. And they know he shed his blood. And that was true. He did shed his blood. Thus, he was the ultimate sacrifice, the lamb of God for Israel's sins. But it was so much more than that that the Israel couldn't explain. And their gospel just is not dependent on understanding it because it has nothing to do with it. Nothing. It was given to Paul to explain. He didn't know either, except Jesus Christ had to explain it to him. After his resurrection and glorification, he had to explain it to Paul. What the torture Six hours of torture, the humiliation. Nobody humiliated the lambs in Exodus and Leviticus. Nobody humiliated them. Nobody put a crown of thorns on the lambs. Nobody beat the lambs within an inch of their lives. No one mocked them. No one paraded them through the streets. They didn't nail them to a cross, but they did that to Christ. None of the circumcision writers could even approach it, and they didn't. Not even Paul approached it when he was addressing his countrymen. He talks about the blood and the priesthood, blood and the priesthood. The only time he mentions the cross, he says a cross, not the cross, suggesting his extremity of anguish and what he endured for his people. But what the cross was doing what the torture was doing, what the thorns were doing, and what the whips were doing was destroying the old humanity and buying our justification, buying our righteousness. Israel didn't dream of any of those benefits, and they don't even come into them, not even during the thousand-year kingdom. But we, I'll get into this more tomorrow, we have these advanced blessings, this advanced understanding of the, cro the cross of Christ that not even the disciples had when they walked with Jesus Christ, but our apostle Paul heard from the glorified Christ who gave him the secrets of the cross, that the blood would reconcile not just one dusty nation in the Middle East, but would reconcile the entire universe, whether it being celestial, terrestrial, or subterranean. That anguish, that torture, bought the salvation and the reconciliation of the entire universe.